Good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Workforce Reentry Services. I just want to thank you all for taking time um, in your day uh, to join us. Um, I'm kind of excited today because we have this presentation, plus we have the Mars lander. Uh, uh, going to break through the Mars atmosphere today and land. So definitely an exciting Thursday uh, for February. So um, just wanted to go over a few housekeeping things and some uh, materials. Um, everybody will be muted during the presentation, depending on how. Um, you can interact with myself and the presenter, uh, Rhonda Freeland, today. We do ask that the questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation, but if there's some technical issues or some clarification issues, I'll be monitoring to that and then respond to those um, as well. So today's presentation is uh, on the workforce reentry services for customers who have criminal records that impact their ability to find employment. The reentry program is designed to provide additional individualized, individualized services, excuse me, using WorkSource Hub Hunter series workshops, additional workshops tailored to specific client needs, one-on-one -on -one resume review, job referrals, and job and referrals to support employment programs to support the customer needs. A couple of takeaways we're hoping to provide you today is to educate you about the work source and that they offer a variety of resources for customers with criminal justice records to obtain employment and training services. And it's not just about the criminal justice conviction, but the customer's behavior has impact on employment opportunities. The third target is getting a copy of employment records and other public records to develop a resume and developing the criminal history speech or a disclosure speech. And the 2018 Fair Chance Act. This legislative act was enacted to remove discipline, <clears throat> discriminatory hiring practice to create a fair and equal opportunity to find employment. And today we have Rhonda Freeland with us. She's a work source reentry specialist with Employment Security Department. She provides services for the Kitsap, Kualam, and Jefferson counties. She works with customers who are criminal justice connected, seek education, training, and employment opportunities. Rhonda provides workshops and case management services that are specifically designed to assist individuals with their reemployment goals. Rhonda has worked for the state of Washington for 13 years. Congratulations on that record in the law enforcement and social service community. Her previous job assignment included working for the Washington Department of Corrections as a community corrections officer, supervising individuals in the community, and as a community correction office specialist instructing cognitive behavior therapy classes. Rhonda joined the Employment Security Department in May 2020 to develop programs for customers who have criminal justice background barriers. Rhonda has a Bachelor's of Arts degree in criminal justice from the University of Memphis and a Master's in Public Administration from Seattle University. A warm virtual applause for uh, Rhonda. I'll hand it over to you. All right, thank you everybody. Darren, can you still hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay, great, awesome. So hi everybody who's listening. Um, I hope wherever you are that you're staying warm and dry on this Thursday morning. So I'm gonna go right into the material and talk about our reentry services at WorkSource. So what is WorkSource? WorkSource is a statewide partnership of state, local, and nonprofit agencies that provide an array of employment and training services to job seekers and employers in Washington. A part of the partnership um, as a department. So part of our, um, um, what what WorkSource does is that we are a one-stop center for reemployment services. So the customer can visit us at our center and receive a wide variety of different services based on their individual needs. 
We offer reemployment services to meet their needs. This could be um, helping them find a job, um, providing labor market information, connecting them to veteran services or WIOA services, or connecting them to job training um, to increase their skill set to make them more marketable. We do use a braided service delivery to help you understand the services and assistance available. So this is like our reentry services. It's a multi-service model where we reach a broad um, array of different services based on the customer. And then some programs um, available through the state, um, we do have our one-stop centers, which are our big centers, and then we have our affiliate offices um, in our smaller communities that provide a variety of services as well. Um, so reentry services like this one, we do offer training for our youth. So we do work with our young adults and our youth from 16 to 24, older workers who are entering the market and our, of course our dislocated worker population. And these are folks who have lost their job through no fault of their own. Our workforce services are through a DSHS. These are our customers who are on TANF and need additional support services, one-on-one -on -one case management, getting them connected to the employment community. Um, our seasonal farm worker program is working with our migrant farmer population. And then employment services, um, such as our unemployment services, our reentry and job assistance um, services. So it's a variety of services that we offer based on, on the customer. Customers access services electronically through WorksourceWall.com is our main website that has a variety of different things for the customer. And through our network of more than 60 WorkSource centers, affiliates, and connection sites throughout Washington State. And studies show that people who use WorkSource services tend to find work faster and earn more money than those who do not. So right now, because of COVID, we are 100% virtual. None of our um, front-facing offices are open, but we have um, changed a lot of our platform to where you can access a lot of our services online. And that goes going through our portal at WorksourceWall.com. All our job hunter classes, our um, additional classes, strategies for success, my workshop starting over, employment after incarceration is all off offered virtually um, and can be accessed either uh, through their computer, a tablet, or on the phone. So we do offer a different platforms to reach our customers. You can post a resume and look for work, attend a virtual hiring event with an employer. We use Brazen technology to connect our customers one-on-one -on -one with, one -on -one with employers that are hiring. So it's kind of like they enter a chat room and they're connecting directly with that employer. And then, of course, one-on-one -on -one appointments with a career and employment specialist where we can meet with them virtually um, over WebEx or Teams or whatever platform they'd like to use and connect with that employer to assist them in finding employment. So just some statistics about reentry, folks who are, who are criminal justice connected. Um, a 2011 study of the formerly incarcerated found that employment was the single most important factor in decreasing recidivism. There are about 70 million people in the United States that have some sort of criminal record. This can be anything from a traffic infraction to a misdemeanor or felony conviction. There is a vast difference between being charged with a crime and the ultimate conviction during the adjudication process. So when a person is arrested, that's when they're charged. But there's a big difference between charging somebody with a crime um, going through the court process, which is called the adjudication, and then ultimately the conviction. Since Washington State uses an indeterminate sentencing system or scoring system based on points, a person can be sentenced, um, can be convicted of a felony and sentenced to prison but never serve a day in prison. And now this person has a record that will continue the punishment cycle indefinitely, even after the court has sentenced them, and even after their case has been closed. According to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, 95% of today's prison population will eventually be released into communities. More than 700,000 will transition out of state and federal correctional facilities each year. And between 12 and 14 million individuals with some form of criminal history live in our communities today. So it's very probable that someone listening to our broadcast today has something in their background. That is why it's important that employment services include assisting customers with justice with justice, sorry, I'll try this again. That's why it's important that employment services include insist, assisting customers with justice of all backgrounds as part of the individualized programming. 
This customer population contributes to our community health and well-being. They pay taxes and they are part of our social support system that allow communities to grow. So here, based on the statistics, the average recidivism rate is 31 to 71 percent, but decreases down to 9 percent when a formerly incarcerated person becomes employed. When we look at this number, by employing 100 former incarcerated persons, this will increase our tax contributions by 1.9 million and boost sales tax revenue by 777,000 per 100 people. So you can see how it's important for folks in this category find employment because they contribute to the community's tax base that allow that community to grow and sustain itself. Hiring managers report that applicants can compensate for criminal records based on their personalities and in-person contact with hiring authorities. And this comes down to that behavior piece. So what are reentry services? We offer services for customers who have justice involvement or background records that may hinder employment provided by staff who understand their challenges. So this is due through um, a variety of different services that we offer. The main service that we offer is our virtual Fresh Start workshop, which is available at 10 a.m. every Wednesday online. So in this class, I talk about how to, how to get employment records. Washington State has records Oops. Darren, am I still recording? Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can still hear you. Okay, because I'm just getting, um, it says sharing screen is now paused, so just make sure that everyone can still see me. Um, so we can get employment records, so if that person has worked for a legitimate employer, we can actually find out who they work for when and contact information to help them build their resume. The only exception to this rule is they ever work for federal employment, they worked under the table, or they work for a nonprofit agency, we would not necessarily have those records. In this workshop, I explain the Fair Chance Act. This act is a legislative act mandated by um, our legislature that is kind of like a ban the box. I explain in this workshop, I explain how it works and how to convey this with an employer. We talk about employer incentives such as bonding and work, the work opportunity tax credit, and they actually get the flyers in their workbooks that they can take to an employer. I review goal setting, overcoming barriers, setting reasonable expectations in your job search, and developing the conviction history speech, which is a way for that person to actually, when they interview with an employer, uh, a method that I used for them to convey um, their background, but in a way that they're also selling their skills. The class comes with a workbook to practice their skills so that even after the class is over, they can use this to practice. They can request one-on-one -on -one and individualized meeting with me or any reentry specialist in their local area. And then, of course, we refer them to other eligible services. In individualized meeting, we discuss career goals, training needs, and current work skills, resume and cover letter development, and how to access the worksourcewall.gov, um, .com, and, and other job boards. I also refer customers to other services and workshops based on their individual needs. Based on the customer's individual skill set, they may need additional job training to become job ready. And this could be through different programs, such as our WIOA program, um, education, or short-term training programs based on the interests of the customer. So this is kind of really what um, our customers get when they take the workshop. They get a wide variety of resources and information, and then they get a toolkit to help themselves become job ready. Our other program that we work with is we work with um, Washington State Department of Corrections. Um, we actually connect with them where they can take the workshop on demand based on wherever they are and receive the same services. These folks are actually getting ready to release back into the community and this is an excellent opportunity to reach them and get them job ready. The starting over, already over workshop is available to inmates releasing back into the community within the next six months. Our correctional industry staff is who we um, connect the bridge with because they're the ones actually going into the facility. So we work with them one-on-one, -on -one, and they can request the workshop based on the participant's availability, not when our workshop is hosted. 
So there's two workshops. There's the public one every Wednesday at 10 a.m. And then we work within the prisons where they have the workshop on demand um, based on that person's availability because we're relying on that institution to make that person available. We can also have um, customers attending um, the workshop from multiple facility facilities at the same time. So, um, you know, uh, an individual in one facility on the eastern side and another individual on the western side of the state, they can both attend that workshop at the same time on the same channel and receive that information. They're provided a workbook to practice skills before they are released to help them become job ready. The workbook has contact information for every reentry specialist in the designated counties. So when individuals released from facilities, they're spread across the state. So it's important with that workbook, we have contact information that no matter where they go, they're released to in that community, they have someone to reach out to immediately. So that way they're not wasting time, they become frustrated and go back to old behaviors. And of course we share our employer resource information with CI staff because for people that are already in the community, they can pass that information along. This program is designed to provide customers with information about looking for work after release. Customers leaving facilities have an adjustment period based on how long they were in prison. The longer the sentence, the longer the adjustment period. Social norming cycles tell us that people will return to behavior patterns that have worked for them in the past to meet their fundamental needs. This readjustment period is an excellent opportunity to bridge the gap, setting new positive behavior, behavior patterns by encouraging the customer to seek employment instead of returning to behavior patterns that led to incarceration. Often the customer does not reach out to services until they are in dire need, and by then it may be too late to connect that person to meaningful employment before they return to negative behavior. By offering work source services before release, the service at least provides customers with the fundamental information they need to start thinking about job search and employment and becoming job ready. Excuse so for example, Rana? yes. Um, I've just got a message from uh, attendees that maybe the slides are frozen. Um, are you still on the what are reentry services slide? No, I'm all the way on connected to customers with, with Washington DO, uh, State DOC facilities. Do you okay. not see that? No, we're still on the what are reentry services slide. Um, hold on a second, because I'm getting a warning. It says screen sharing is now paused for just a moment. Let me see. What about now? Uh, we lost the presentation. There we're back. Okay. okay so now we're on connected with customers and WA State, State DOC. So it might be helpful. Can you go back to? Yeah, okay, now we're at reentry services, and I'm sorry, but to continue from the end of that slide. Okay, okay. so here, um, so, uh, so is this where it froze? Yeah, that's what, the, that was the slide where I think people were on um, and weren't able to see the next slide and, and the information that was presented. Okay. So what can you see now connected with customers in DOC facilities? Yes. Okay, so this is what I just was explaining, um, that we do connect with our customers in DOC facilities who are getting ready to, re to release within six months to the community. So the premise of this program, um, did, you, did, they, did you hear the information at all or do I need to repeat the whole thing? Darren, are you there? Oh, I am. I'm just looking at the dialogue. Um, okay. So it sounds like um, people were able to hear the information. It just might be helpful to, if there's some other high points in there, just to correlate to the bullet points. Okay. Yeah. So here, um, the starting over workshop, like I said, it's available to inmates based on their schedule and their facility, um, because if they are, because they are, um, the the facilities the inmate is located in or the the individual is located in. Um, you know, they have their own schedules, so we can't not necessarily expect that customer to attend our public workshop because that's very structured every day at 10. But we make our, our services available at the needs of the customer based on their schedule. And that's kind of really the beauty of this program is that we're meeting the customer's needs on where they are at that moment. So staff, CI staff, who is our bridge to the facilities because they have access to the prisons right now, we actually coordinate with them to provide the workshop um, based on the customer availability. 
So in the workshop, um, they attend, it's kind of like the same material as the public workshop, but they just get a little more in-depth information. They provided a workbook to practice skills before they're released. So in this workbook, um, it's the same information that we go over goal setting. We talk about how to overcome barriers, such as going through the brainstorming process. We talk about um, there's information regarding um, our Job Hunter series and all the classes that we offer. So they at least have a baseline synopsis. And the workbook is also um, wor uh, worksheets for them to start developing their conviction history speech. And it's really formula based. So here, uh, for example, we may talk about how to take responsibility for your behavior, understanding your criminal history, and then how to develop, um, how to explain your skills and abilities to an employer that you're a good fit for that organization. And it breaks it down into a formula, which is a step-by-step -step process where they can put it together, kind of like in a, um, in a cover sheet where they don't submit, but it allows them to practice this with someone they trust so they can really start conveying to those employers because when they leave the facility, we want them to be able to hit the ground running to find employment before going back to old behaviors. So the next screen you should see is the Welcome Home program. Darren, do you see that screen? Um, I do. I see the Welcome Home program. We just had a request um, if you were able to slow down um, um, your rate of speech a little bit so people can uh, get all the information that they need. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, Thank is you. It, no problem. Would any, is there a request for me to go back and repeat anything? Um, I haven't seen that request. Um, I know there was an earlier request. Maybe we'll have to kind of go back during the questions. Um, to see okay. What comes. Okay. So in this program, the Welcome Home program is another program that we offer, well, that we work with our nonprofit partners. So the Kitsap Community Reentry Task Force is a task force um, that covers Jefferson Clallam and the Kitsap area and the Port Gamble Skylam tribe. Um, and they partnered with us uh, to provide reentry services to customers who are currently incarcerated in jail or recently released from Kitsap County Jail with reentry services using the human dignity model. So just like we do with our public uh, front-facing workshop and then our prisons workshop working directly with DOC, we also work with the local jails providing the same information. So a customer may not be in a state facility, but they may be being housed in a local jail. So before COVID, we would go into the jail working with those customers one-on-one, -on -one, connecting with them. But um, now that we connect with them um, after release, so that person who um, is in the community um, and is unfortunately in the jail system, um, we still connect with them. And then, of course, the Welcome Home progr program is with our other community partners that also provide services. And they kind of really use that human dignity model where there's no judgment. Um, they're just kind of they're there to walk alongside them, to provide them resources, and connect them to other things that they need to help moving them towards pro-social behavior. And I don't know what happened here. Okay. Not sure what's going on. Hold on a moment. I apologize. This is really weird. Uh, so, and then they use the trauma. There we go. Sorry, hold on a second. I'm not sure why it's doing this, but they use the trauma-informed practices like restorative circles, allowing community members, including law enforcement, to come together to discuss community issues. And then customers are assigned a life coach to assist them with any services they may need. Under this program, WorkSource provides reentry services while the customer is still incarcerated. Much like our DOC program, the goal is to break the cycle of behavior that leads to arrest and connect that customer with employment. So in this section, I talk about what it what the customer needs to become job ready. And that's an important part of the process. And this speaks to behavior. If that customer isn't job ready, um, then they're not ready to go to work. And that plays a big part of them being able to find employment and then maintain employment. 
because it's one thing to find work, it's another to be able to maintain that relationship with that employer. So here we're looking at individuals with any kind of justice connection connected record realistically can be denied employment even if they are the most qualified person for the job. The customer must be emotionally ready to engage in employment. This includes demonstrating pro-social behaviors even after they become employed. Not only do customers need resume assistance but skill assessments to determine what jobs they are qualified to apply for. So we look at what skills they ha already have. And then individuals may need adjust, uh, additional assistance with short-term training or education programs to develop marketable skills. Washington State is considered an at-will employment state, meaning the employer can hire and terminate an employee at will as long as they are not violating any discriminatory laws. It is important for the customer that when speaking with employers during the interview process, they disclose their background as appropriate. This means knowing what's on their public record, taking responsibility for past behavior, discussing what they are doing to improve themselves, or fix old behavior patterns, and selling their skills to keep the employer interested. Employers can set their own policies around background issues. Even the most qualified person for the job can be passed over because of a criminal background record or poor driving skills that makes them uninsurable. If that customer is going to be driving a company vehicle or operating company equipment that requires them to be insurable, a poor driving record or no driving record um, can also make a difference. Being emotionally ready to engage in employment is the process by demonstrating new behavior patterns to indicate they are reliable and ready to work. The customer needs to have under control any mental health, drug addictions, and medical issues. This includes continuing to demonstrate pro-social behaviors even after they're employed. Now, hold on, it's acting up again, just a moment. Darren, can you still see my screen? I can see becoming job ready slide. Okay, yeah, that's where I'm at. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Um, so here I stress in my workshops, um, this includes the community to demonstrate pro-social behaviors even after they're employed. So I stress to act as if. That customer needs to act as if they don't have a record when they're on the job. They only need to discuss criminal histories with hiring managers and supervisors who need to know. Don't advertise um, to others any jail or prison involvement. They need no, do not share opinions about the criminal justice system the government or the police in general or their case. I stress that employers think about risk and how this person is going to affect their business. The job and they ask themselves, is the job seeker at risk to me, others, staff, my customers, and following my business? So it is that risk management mindset that employers thinking about um, in hiring this person. You know, hiring anybody for a job is kind of really an educated guess based on information. But, you know, when someone has a background issue, and depending on what it is, risk also plays into whether or not they make a decision to hire that person. Each customer comes with their own individual circumstances about their skills, abilities, education, and work history. The customer will need an assessment based on their individual circumstances and what jobs they qualify for. While minimum wage jobs may be the only option at that moment, we want to refer customers to other services that will provide training opportunities to build skill sets so they can obtain higher wage jobs. And this leads to increased community safety for all. So here in this slide, I'm referring to legislative policy 4994, which is the Washington Fair Chance Act. This protects job applicants with a criminal record. The law prohibits employers from automatically or categorically excluding workers from consideration before determining they are otherwise qualified for the position. This law went into effect in June of 2018, and you can find more information from the Attorney General's office around the specific parameters. In my workshop and in my classes, I actually provide the handout from the Attorney General's office so our job seekers know their rights. 
The Fair Chance Act Legislative Policy 4994 is a policy that states employers are no longer allowed to ask questions on applications about background. They can no longer run background checks without written consent or, or require the applicant to sign disclosure statements asking about criminal history with the threat of termination for failure to disclose. Back in the day, they used to be able to ask those questions. Ban the box legislation is now in 16 states and over 100 cities that prohibit employers from asking questions about criminal history during the application process. In Washington state specifically, the employer must be able to articulate the candidate as otherwise qualified for the position before inquiring about any background. This gives the job seeker at least the opportunity to meet with employers to discuss how they are a good fit for the position. This allows employers to consider each candidate individually instead of categorically dismissing the applicant for simply checking a box indicating an issue. There's a lot of debate around whether or not fair uh, ban the box um, initiatives work. Um, one side is the fact that it, it's, you know, it's still, you know, it gives the employer to still dismiss this person and leads them on in their job search. The other side is that at least it gives the opportunity for the job seeker to meet with that employer and to consider their case on an individual basis instead of having their application just automatically dismissed because they checked a box indicating an issue and then they never talk to that employer at all. So there's still a lot of debate around this and whether or not this legislation actually works and there's still a lot of research. But we're seeing states use this more often because we don't want individuals in the community um, just categorically being discriminated, leading to increased unemployability. So what we do have some resources for employers. You know, we want to encourage employers to hire individuals under certain categories. The first one is the Washington State Federal, uh, Washington State Federal Bonding Program. So I tell customers to think of this kind of like a car insurance policy for the employer. Is completely free. The employer just needs to notify us, the person they hired. But it operates as a fidelity bond. It protects the employers against employee fraud and dishonesty. Employers receive the bonds free of charge as an incentive to hire um, these kind of applicants that fit this category. They just need to notify us. In the workbook each customer gets when they take my class, they actually get the handout they can make copies of and take this to the employer that gives them instructions on how to apply for the bond. So that way it's something they can give the employer to show that this is really a, a viable option for them. The bonding program is designed to reimburse the employer for any loss due to employee theft, money or property up to $25,000 for the first six months of an individual's term of employment. This is the least used program in Washington State and it's the most viable program to protect employers should they hire somebody with a background and things go sideways. The other program is on the federal side. This is mainly through um, tax credits they can receive on their side, their required side that they pay on that person's salary. The Work Opportunity Tax Credit Program is a federal tax credit available to employers for hiring individuals from certain targeted groups who have faced significant barriers to employment. And they simply would get a tax rebate on the first $2,400 of taxable wages that they would otherwise pay um, on the first $9,600 wages. So the rebate is $2,400 maximum on the first $9,600 of wages. And this employer would take the benefit when they file their um, their quarterly or their yearly tax their tax um, taxes on their business. Again, this information regarding the work opportunity tax credit is available to the employer in the workbook, so that customer can make a copy of the information and provide this to the employer. So when they go for an interview, they at least have this material to show that there's some additional benefit in hiring them. And right now, given our economic situation, um, this is a good way for the employer to save some money when um, everyone is hurting because of COVID. WorkSource serves every county in the state, so we have something for somebody everywhere, no matter where they release to. 
Um, so it's vitally important that we get that information to them, and that's why in the workbook we have a listing of every reentry person throughout Washington State, so no matter where they live, they have someone to connect to. And of course, WorkSource, we are here for you in the community to provide services as we need to get you connected to employment. Here is my reference page that I use for the information today. If you are interested in more information, these are some sources used in developing today's presentation. I recommend visiting the National, I'm sorry, the National Institute of Corrections website, um, and it's ncic.gov. This government research agency conducts research and develops tools for communities around law enforcement, corrections, and reentry programming. The library offers a wealth of information, research documents, published reports, and webinars around this topic. Thank you for listening to me today. Are there any questions I can answer? Thanks for that presentation, Rhonda, and navigating through some of the technical hiccups that we uh, experienced during our oh. virtual presentation. So thank you so much for your perseverance with that. Um, yeah. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, one question is from Sean. Can the employer ask if you have a criminal record on the application and provide the choice, choose not to answer? No, under the Fair Chance Act, they had to remove that from, they had to remove that altogether. So back in the day, there used to be um, questions on applications, like do you have a criminal history? Or in the last 10 years, have you been convicted of a felony or a misdemeanor? Do you have a poor driving record? Do you have a driver's license? And if they char checked yes, then you know they would give them the opportunity to explain. But what we found out that employers were using this as a catch to automatically disregard that person altogether. Mm -hmm. So no, the Fair Chance Act specifically says that those questions can no longer be on applications at all. Um, you can only ask those questions when the employer has made the determination that person is qualified for the job and they either talk with them either a phone interview or a formal interview. At that point, if, it's, if the background is related to the business needs, then they can inquire about it. But at least this gives the opportunity for the employer to consider this person like everyone else based on their skill set and not automatically um, remove them from consideration because they checked a box. Great. Thank you, Rhonda. The other question we have um, was a little bit about the bonding. So I did put a website in. It looks like that was part of the a DOL website, uh, Bond for Jobs. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you have some other information um, that maybe I can um, add to when I send out the um, slide deck, if there's some um, more information that might be available about the bond. Um, so the question was um, some suggestions about how to talk to an employer about this so they can, so they don't get cold feet. Yeah. So. Um so the first clue to really talk about background is if the employer is going to say that we need to run a background check on you or they ask you the question. So this is kind of really when developing cues in that conversation of when you need to start going down that road. Um, you know, if the employer says that you need to sign a consent for a background check, that's going to be the first clue that maybe you need to start talking about some of these other programs. So, I mean, I think the way to approach this is going to be obviously appropriately disclose, disclosing what's going on with your individual circumstances, but then also say, if you hire me, here are some opportunities available to you, such as our bonding program, right, um, and our, the work opportunity tax credit program, and here's some information about that program so you know how to apply for it, you know what's involved in this and how to apply it to you um, if you want to participate in the program. So that's why those, those flyers, and I can send you um, our version as well, um, that's why it's important those flyers in the workbook are actually you know, terrible and they can make copies and give that to the employer as well. And they can also email it to them if they scan it in. They can pull that flyer from our website as a PDF and give it to that employer if they're doing a virtual interview. Great, uh, thank you. So the, we, we got quite a f uh, few uh, robust questions developing um, <laughs> as you're uh, answering these ones, so thank you. Um, can employers ask about criminal history in a phone screening? Um, yes, they can, because at that point it turns into, um, 
you know, a phone interview. So the only thing that limits the employers is actually in the application phase. So there's different phases of the hiring process. There's the application phase or the resume phase. There's a review phase from the employer. There's the initial determination, hey, I want to talk to this person. By making that action of a phone interview, at that point, they can inquire about background. Oh, wow, uh, thank you for that clarification. Um, if something was missed, does that mean it won't show up on a background check? Oh, I, I'm sorry, dismissed. I'm having troubles reading this morning for the small print in the so, chat. Yeah, box. so the only <laughs> thing that shows up on a public record are convictions. So um, there's a big difference between arrest, right? Because at arrest, the police officer has probable cause to charge with a crime, and then they charge what's on the books based on the information at hand. The adjudication process is when the case gets into court in front of a judge. So when you have that first hearing, um, that due process hearing starts the adjudication phase, and then the conviction. So if the court can determine there is not enough evidence to move forward with charges based on information, they can dismiss that case. And dismissed case um, are act, you know, those basically says that while the officer had probable cause to arrest somebody, the court does not have enough information or finding to say that we can actually convict someone based on this information. So the case, so the charges are dismissed or no low processed. You may see that too. And um, initially, no, those dismissed cases will not show up on a public record, only convictions. Wow, great. Uh, technical information in that response. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, can you connect to basic needs for interviews, interview clothing, transportation vouchers? Does your unit or the workforce have that kind of uh, resource ac access to some of the clients you serve? We do. We actually, um, WorkSource, if WorkSource can't provide it, uh, some of our programs do provide that through like Work First, which is a DSHS program. But we do have some of our nonprofit partners in the community that we work with that provide those additional core services to help someone become job ready. So if WorkSource as an agency doesn't have that because they don't fall into that particular program, we will look to our nonprofit partners that we also work with that has some other criteria that might be able to provide additional services to that person. So our goal is to connect that person to all the available services that they're eligible for, whether it's a government service like WorkSource or our nonprofit partners or other community partners to assist them. So we, we do connect them to our, to we do branch out and connect them to other services to make sure that they have everything that they need. Great, thank you. So the next question, um, is so what if the employer still puts the question on the application about criminal history how should the job seeker answer the question leave it blank notate that the ban the box law prohibits the employer from asking the question not apply with that business so yeah it becomes it, it becomes difficult at that point because i from my understanding the attorney general's office is only um looking at this from from an educational or informative approach. So the job seeker, um, and where we see this, is we see this on companies that are that are headquartered out of state doing business in Washington state, still applying their, their home state's rules. So, you know, it's kind of really one of those things where um, you can either say, you can educate that person to say, this is an illegal question in Washington state, so therefore I'm not going to answer this. A, you still gave yourself away. Um, B, you can answer it knowing that there's a poss possibility that your resume will never even be re reviewed because it automatically will be excluded. Or you can just simply say that I'm not going to waste my time applying for this job knowing this employer may exclude me based on this question. And it's really no difference is under EEOC if me as a female, that employer asks me, um, do you have children? which they can't do because they can't discriminate based on familial status. So it's really along those same lines. It's just managed by the state. So the job seeker really does have to make a decision on what they want to do. Um, they can also report this employer to the attorney general's office. So the attorney general's office can reach out to this employer and educate them about the law. Wow, thank you for that uh, robust uh, response. That's a lot of detail. It's a lot, I'm sorry, it's a lot of information. 
right? And you have a, a wealth of the technical information at your fingertips. So uh, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. The next question is for Michael. Are there expectations to ban the box for some employers? I've, I've seen background check questions for schools, retirement homes, etc. So yeah, so there are special circumstances where that employer does, where that policy doesn't um, um, doesn't apply to that employer. So we see um, those if they're working with specific populations that we consider vulnerable: children, the elderly, the sick, the infirm. Federal contractors don't have to abide by it because obviously they follow federal law. So there are certain job classifications, law enforcement, that kind of thing, to where they can ask those questions because um, they fall under a subset of categories where they're working with vulnerable populations, to where they have they have a right to make sure that you know people are coming in um, that um, don't meet the criteria where they could possibly come in contact with someone in that population and cause harm. Okay, uh, thank you. It looks like there, um, Pam had a question to go back to a page that lists those sites, but um, Pam, if you can be more specific, I don't know if those were some of the resource sites, the references. Um, thank you all for your patience. There's just a lot of robust questions um, being <laughs> sent in. So thank you for your patience and thank you, Rhonda, for addressing these. <laughs> it's like a round robin <laughs> of <laughs> questions for you. <clears throat> no, no, it's, um, it's perfectly fine. Great, thank you. So the next question is, if someone is told a conviction can be sealed, is that an automatic process? No, it is not. Um, a court, a judge has to order the sealing of the record. So, um, so sealing records, basically, those are used more or less used in juvenile cases most of the time. So when we're talking about sealing records, we're actually, the record is still there. They're going to know it's there, but the details are not published. So when you're sealing a record, um, that record may say sealed, um, and there might be some dates. Um, that basically means is that that record was sealed and they cannot see the conviction, but the information may still be there, such as like the dates or, or the court of that record was sealed under. And then there's another category called expungement, or basically the court says, okay, um, this was so long ago in this category, we're going to act as if it didn't happen. Um, and they may see expunged um, on that record as well, again, where the conviction is not av available for them to see, but there might be court information or there might be dates there. So um, all it does is just kind of really remove the headers, um, but that is a court action to either seal the case um, to where no one can access that record, or, um, and then of course, you know, expunge cases is really for more adult cases to where it's kind of along the same thing, but it basically says the court is said, we're just going to make you whole and act as if it didn't happen. And those really kind of go towards sentencing, um, sentencing structures. Wow, thank you. Um, it looks like there was a workbook mentioned in uh, during the presentation. I think there were a couple different uh, workshop groups that you do. So the person, right. Sarah, is asking if there's a chance that we can get a copy of that workbook. Um, I would have to check with my agency. We, we do give it out to our customers, so it is out there. Um, but I'll check with my agency just to make sure it's okay to release it to the general public. Okay, thank you. Um, and somebody's just asking for clarification um, if someone or if one of the client needs to be stable in substance use disorders, mental health disorders, medical issues to be eligible for this program? Yeah, so I mean, as long as they've got it under control, I mean, we're not, obviously, we're not a legal organization. We're not like probation where we use 100% abstinence, but it has to be under control. But that person also has to be able to pass a drug test. I mean, employers are, can still, you know, drug test, um, you know, you know, staff if they need to, and that includes the use of marijuana and alcohol. So if, it, if it's prohibited, um, then obviously they need to refrain from using it because that employer can drug test them and you can be denied employment or you can be terminated employment for a positive drug test. Um, so, you know, those things need to be keeping in mind as well. But that it also speaks to being um, ready and able and available to work. I mean, you need to show up for work ready to be able to work and that speaks to being job ready. So having those things under control is certainly, you know, important. 
um, especially around the use of drugs. I can understand you know, mental health and medical issues, you're going to be working with your doctor on those. But for recreational drug use, um, you know, the employer has the absolute right to drug test you. And if it's prohibited, then you can be terminated for that or denied or denied the job. Great, thank you. Um, and this is from Carolyn in our adult drug court, the practitioners the participants' felonies are dismissed upon graduation from the program. We are a pre-plea program. We have had participants report that they have been turned down for housing or employment because of these dismissed cases on their background. What can they do in this case? So this is kind of really one of those things where they also have to include that in their criminal history speech. Um, you know, and that speaks to back to you know taking responsibility for your behavior so if that is showing up on a public record um, then that also speaks to maybe they need to talk to that employer you know during the conviction history speech and let them know that they can simply just explain the situation that um, it was due to addiction they participated in a drug court program they completed that program they've been clean and sober for however long or they're continuing to participate in treatment and they're choosing to change their behavior by putting this behind them and, and seeking treatment. So it goes back to that method of just reassuring that employer of taking responsibility for what happened, not going into the down and dirty details. They don't need to tell the story. Um, it's really not the employer's business to get the details. They just need the facts. Take responsibility and discuss what they have done to change their lives and always bring it back to the skills and abilities. So it, here it's really more about you know, you are going to have to explain your situation, but sticking to the facts, staying away from opinions, taking responsibilities, and then bringing it back to what you can do for that organization. And you also have to keep in mind that employer is assessing risk in their mind because they want to know that by taking a chance on this person who has a prior history of poor behavior, that they're not going to be a risk to them, to others, to customers, and their business, which is the bottom line. Um, so. I mean, it is something that they are going to have to explain, but by doing that, you know, also comforts and reassures the employer that we all make poor decisions. We can't change our past. Um, we can't change static things about us. But going forward, here's what I'm doing to improve my life, and I just need the opportunity. Um, it looks like there's a couple of questions about the slide deck and the presentation. So I do send out the slide deck after uh, the presentation to those who attended today, um, additional resources um, if that's available, um, as well as there is a recording that you can um, go back and uh, review the presentation again. So that will be coming out on tomorrow, on Friday uh, for folks who attended today. Um, yeah, and it and in the presentation is um, is all the uh, is additional information. So you have the slide deck, but below the slide deck will be um, all the information that I discussed today too. Oh, okay. Like additional notes. Yes, all my okay. notes are in the slides themselves. They're just just they're at the bottom in the notes section. Oh, fantastic! Thank you. Um, and Nico um, is requesting some elaboration on the part about vulnerable populations. She's a job. Nico's a job coach that works with clients with vulnerable, marginalized, marginalized populations. Mm -hmm. So as far as whether or not they can work for them? Um, I don't know. Is there any additional information that you can provide, Nico, for Rhonda to focus on? Let's see if something comes up. I did. Um, there was a question about Brazen, and I had a question about Brazen too, because I know Brazen and the um, ESD had a pilot project last year to focus on um, different job fairs in different categories. Can you just share a little bit more about the work and the uh, projects that you have with Brazen and the platform for the virtual job fairs? Yeah, so uh, Brazen Technology, um, each section um, can host um, hiring events, connecting employers to the individual person. So it's my understanding the way the platform works is that employer there is kind of like um, 
the employer is there, they click on that employer name or their booth and they can actually be connected with that employer and have those kind of like one-on-one -on -one virtual conversations like we're having right now. So we are using Brazing technology across the state. We use it for our virtual hiring events. We're going to be using it for WorkSource social um, services events to where customers can queue in to WorkSource and see what we're about and, and get help with their, their job search and whatever it is that they need. Um, so they are using the Brazing technology for those functions to connect that employer with that customer in a one-on-one -on -one setting um, virtually, um, but also connect them with the different WorkSource offices, um, offices and services that we offer across the state and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with us. So it's kind of like what we're doing right now. Well, wow, thank you, Rhonda. Do you know if there's any kind of workshops that you know prepare people to do those virtual interviews? Because um, my experience with Brazen is is very brief, but there was always um, a, a bit of a screening process that goes on to get into the queue to actually talk to a recruiter. And is there any workshops or um, assistance to prep people for that process? Um, I know that we do have our Jump Hunter series that goes into interview techniques. I, I'm not sure if we're developing additional um, uh, workshops on how to do the virtual interview. That's something that I would have to look into and get back with. Um, I know that um, you know collectively, you know, each of the each of the WDAs are looking to how to make sure that when we're connecting with the customers, that we give them the tools with new technologies. Um, to be able to um, communicate effectively and make those connections. Okay, thank you. Um, and another question was, um, if they had some more questions later um, or resources, would they be able to contact you for additional information? Oh yeah, obviously. Um, my, um, my information is on the first slide. And it looks, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there it is. For some reason, this is not cooperating today. Um, yeah, so uh, my email is rfreeland at esd.wa.gov. And if you want to contact me by phone, my number is 360-516-1044. Again, that's 360-516-1044. And my email is rfreeland, r as in rabbit, f-r-e-e-l-a-n-d at e-s-d dot w-a dot g-o-v. And you are free to send me an email, give me a call, reach out to me. I'll be glad to um, ask, answer any questions or direct you um, if I don't know the answer. Great. Thank you for that. It looks like uh, somebody shared that the Wenatchee Workshop has a virtual um interviewing workshop. So that's great to hear that they have that. Um, it looks like the next question is, um, if they are in a substance abuse outpatient treatment program, how would we go about making a referral over to this program? Who would the client need to contact directly to get set up for these resources? Um, so depending on where they're located, um, they would connect to a reentry service person in their local area. Um, they can reach out to me and I can get them connected to wherever they are. Um, so if, if, if the customer is in a, is the customer an outpatient facility? I, I'm sorry, I got a little confused in the question. Yeah, it looks like they're in an um, outpatient substance abuse treatment program. Okay. Um, they can reach out to me. They can also call their local work source. Um, phone number, we do, you know, we are um, answering the phones at least, um, and they, you know, just ask for the reentry specialist for their designated area, and if that doesn't work, they can always reach out to me and I will get them connected no matter where they are to their local community. So is it true that at least in each county there would be a reentry services um, there, service? Yeah. Yes, we do have a, a reentry designated staff in each county of the state. Um, not at every work source because some are full one-stop centers and some are affiliates, but for every county there is a designated reentry uh, person, you know, designated to those to those areas. Oh, great! Thank you for that uh, clarification. So um, somebody just asked, how do you connect to Brazen Virtual? Job fairs. Is there a connection at WorkSource or or somewhere else to, for people yes. to get connected? Yeah, so you would go to our website, WorkSourceWall.com, 
and um, under the hiring events tab is where you would sign up for that um, for those hiring events. Great, thank you. Um, definitely, thank you all for um, all the questions and the, definitely the technical assistance and and uh, robust uh, responses you provided, Rhonda. I just want to see if there was anything else from the audience today um, to share. And definitely, if things come up, definitely we have uh, Rhonda's um, information to connect. And when I send out some information, you can. Uh, reach out to me as well. I'll do my best to connect you to the information or the resources or some answers uh, that might come up. I want to thank you all for attending today and having uh, a great dialogue and questions. And thank you so much, Rhonda, for sharing um, all these resources with the audience today. Again, I'll be sending out a link to the recording as well as resources. Um, do you have any anything else to share, Rhonda? Um, yeah, the only thing I share is if, you know, if you have customers or you are a customer and you're looking for work or you're stuck, um, you're not sure where to go with your job search and you're not sure what to do, reach out to your work source because we are here to help you. We are here to serve your community. Um, don't let your background um, get that negative mindset that just because you have something in your history that you're not unemployable. You are employable. There is something for everybody and it's really all about finding what's going to work for you as the individual person. Um, you can go to worksourcewall.com and go to um, the workshops. My workshop is called Starting Over Employment After Incarceration. This workshop is every Wednesday at 10 a.m. online. I use the WebEx platform and you just need to sign up. Um, once you sign up, I will send you the key to the class. I will also send you the workbook. I'll send you information about the Fair Chance Act, and I'll send you information about our DVR services for folks who, um, who who have some sort of vocational disability. We also have we also work with DVR to provide some additional resources for individuals. So all you have to do is just sign up for the class at WorksourceWall.com. You go to our workshops page, and it's every Wednesday at 10 a.m. And is that called a uh, fresh start? It, yeah, it's called starting over employment after incarceration is the title. And what I could do is I can send that flyer to you um, to pass along, which has the information. Oh, that'd be perfect. Thank you so much. That is great. Yeah, yeah I can send that uh, along to you. The other uh, web uh, connection or resource that I'll add is the um, Healthcare Authority DBHR um, works um, or has Pathways to Employment uh, website, and we do have some information and resources uh, about individuals with uh, justice involvement um, histories and um, um, information to access on that. So I'll include that when I send the, the recording of this uh, training out. Um, okay. So I'm just looking over to see if there's any more questions, and it looks like we got to the end. So thank you all for your patience and go, having me go through and read uh, the questions and uh, have Rhonda response. Thank you. It was very robust, and thank you for your expertise today, uh, Rhonda. It was great to hear about all the specifics and the resources that you work with. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me. Great. We'll go ahead and sign off. Thank you again for all the information and the interaction today. I always like to see some robust conversations.